tonight. How did the suspect in a Vancouver triple stabbing get an unescorted day pass from a psychiatric facility? How is it possible when a review board says this guy's dangerous, he shouldn't be released, that then he gets released and attacks people? BC's premier orders an independent review. From housing to groceries, the government under pressure makes promises. This plan is going to get more apartments built. That issue is here to break down if this is enough. And people across the Maritimes brace as Hurricane Lee crawls north. I do want to stress the importance of not being complacent with this storm. Tracking the path, the landfall, and what it could bring. This is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. Thanks for joining us. We begin in B.C., where the Premier is taking new action to try to answer an urgent question. How did a violent inmate labeled as a significant threat get released on a day pass and then allegedly go on to stab three strangers? Former Abbotsford Police Chief Bob Rich will review how the suspect in the violent rampage in Vancouver's Chinatown last weekend was able to leave a forensic psychiatric facility in Coquitlam without an escort, despite a history of violent psychotic episodes. And as Michelle Gassoub explains, it comes as new information emerges that officials knew he was a threat to public safety. From the BC Premier, an urgently launched probe. The core question of how a violent, psychotic individual was released into community to attack innocent people is the question that needs to be answered. Former Abbotsford Police Chief Bob Rich will lead an independent review into Blair Donnelly's case. Accountability will flow from the determination of how we got into this position. Donnelly was allowed to leave this forensic psychiatric hospital on an unsupervised day pass before allegedly going on to stab three people in Vancouver Sunday. He was incarcerated here after killing his 16-year-old daughter in 2008, a crime for which he was found not criminally responsible. Documents first obtained by Czech News in Victoria and shared with the CBC reveal Donnelly had been labelled a significant threat to public safety as recently as April. The BC Review Board described Donnelly as an unpredictable person prone to violent episodes, he stabbed two other people while in custody and had a high risk of relapse. The document said all the incidents occurred without warning signs and that two relapses occurred after lengthy periods of remission. Mr. Donnelly has no insight into his deterioration. He requires significant supervision to ensure he does not cause further harm to the public. The BC Review Board has denied CBC's request for the documents and has declined an interview. Donnelly was allowed out without an escort, despite that recommendation from the board, a decision made at the discretion of the Forensic Psychiatric Hospital's executive director. The Provincial Health Services Authority has initiated its own critical incident review and says it's cooperating with all other investigations. There's an issue of confidence here, and um, the public deserve to know that if there are, were mistakes made, that they're being addressed so that there is no likelihood of a repeat in the future. And Michelle, we've learned about some of the questions Bob Rich will be looking into, right? Yeah, so Bob Rich will be looking into two questions. One, how is it possible that someone was released without an escort when the review board recommendation was that they have supervision? And two, are there other people out there that fit this profile who do have day passes? Now, uh, Rich's review will start right away. EB says he will be given access to all the people and documents needed for the investigation, and the top priority will be public safety. All right, Michelle Gassoub in Vancouver. Turning now to a pressing issue for so many Canadians, the cost of living. The federal government says it has a new plan to tackle the crisis from housing to grocery prices. But as Ashley Burke shows us, some are asking why it took so long. The Prime Minister says his caucus is working together after MPs say there was tough talk behind closed doors. We are having difficult sometimes conversations, but important conversations. And the Prime Minister signaled very clearly yesterday that he is going to be listening uh, in a new way to the caucus. So we're, we're very interested in that. Liberal MPs looking for a message from the Prime Minister that they can take home to constituents angry about the cost of living. 
This is about the people that I've met across the country. It's about the people our, our, our MPs have spent the summer with, talking with, who are worried uh, about paying rent, about finding an apartment, about being able to buy a home. In an attempt to show they'll fight for Canadians, Trudeau and his ministers announcing the government will force big grocery stores, turning big profits, to stabilize prices. We're going to bring them in Ottawa, talk to them around meaningful action, and if they fail to do so, there'll be consequences. Trudeau's also reviving a campaign promise from 2015 on housing that his government scrapped six years ago, but the NDP has called for for months now. We are going to be removing the federal GST for the construction of new apartment buildings, and I'm encouraging all provinces to do the same. The announcement's a shot back at Conservative leader Pierre Polyev, who's found popularity hammering the Liberals on the cost of living. After eight years of Trudeau doubling the cost, I'm the one that can fix it. Polyev calls the GST announcement a move to get ahead of the Conservatives' plan. Justin Trudeau promised to do this eight years ago. Six years ago, he said, just kidding, promise broken. And now, this morning, just as he got wind that this was going to be in my bill, he's flip-flopped again. The government has been aware of the housing crisis for years, now forced to defend why it hasn't done more and faster. We're going to do everything we can to work as quickly as possible. Uh, are we where I want us to be? No. I think we need to do more and we do need to go faster. And I'll be the first to acknowledge that. Ashley, Parliament returns next week. What should we expect? Well, Adrian, the Liberals are trying to project enthusiasm and say they're in solution mode. And that's because this is far from the end of the housing or affordability crisis and the debate over how to handle it all. Expect this to dominate the discussion in Ottawa when MPs return next week. All right, Ashley Burke, thank you. Rosie, in the ad issue panel, we'll have more on today's affordability announcements. Is the government doing enough? Is the Liberal caucus unified? That's later. Almost a year after Fiona tore through Atlantic Canada, many across the region are once again bracing tonight as they watch Hurricane Lee push closer. The powerful storm is growing in size. It's expected to make landfall Saturday, though exactly where is still the question. Weather alerts remain in effect across the region. Now, Lee is not expected to be a repeat of Fiona, but officials are warning people to take it seriously. Shana Luck now with how many are getting ready. But this bit here, they would split it from where it's Daniel McIntyre knows all too well how much destruction storms can bring. It was quite devastating when we seen this arrangement, what happened with the force of the water. He's still repairing damage from torrential rain and floods in July as he watches Hurricane Lee get closer. Thanks, guy. And he's not alone. In Halifax, long lines as many stock up before the storm's landfall Saturday. New Brunswick also telling residents, get ready. I do want to stress the importance of not being complacent with this storm. At this marina near Moncton, the president of the Port Authority says there's no knowing what will happen after the last two hurricanes came in from different directions. We've had major storm surges and we've been lucky in the past overall, but uh, we've also got some pretty big damages in the past and it's just better safe than sorry. And while PEI is expected to take less of a hit, officials are still opening reception centres for people who need to shelter. We must stay sensible and be prepared for whatever comes our way. All this almost one full year after the region was pummeled by Fiona. While memories of that disaster are still fresh, Lee is not expected to bring the same devastation. But in terms of intensity, uh, it, you know, nothing like, um, like we saw with, uh, with Fiona last year. Back in Bedford, Daniel McIntyre says he'll be ready. We've had storms here before. I mean, it's Nova Scotia you're in, so we'll see what comes from it. Knowing that whatever happens, someone will have to pick up the pieces after. Shana Lux, CBC News, Halifax. Meteorologist Ryan Snodden is back with us tonight from Halifax. So Ryan, can you take us through that detailed forecast just as Lee closes in? Yeah, still a category one storm, Adrian, and moving northward now at a pretty good clip. It will continue to weaken over the next 24 hours, but we are expecting it to move into the region 
as a category one storm or a very strong tropical storm transitioning to a post tropical storm, which means the wind field spreads out and really will make its effects known across the region Saturday into Sunday. Okay, so we know the storm is not expected to hit with, you know, Fiona's force, but it does appear to be bringing some potential dangers, right? Like strong winds, those really strong waves. Absolutely, especially in the southwest of Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, closest to Lee's track. This is where we have the greatest likelihood of gusts exceeding 90 kilometers per hour. This is where outages look the most likely and possible damage, especially along the coast where we could see gusts up to 120. Also keeping an eye on the surge, this big push of water that will come with this storm. Less concern tonight about the Bay of Fundy, but the Canadian Hurricane Center mentioning specifically Shelburne, Liverpool to Halifax, high tide time Saturday morning and again Saturday evening. This big wall of water will push a lot of water inland. Could see sea levels pushing one meter above high tide both in the morning and the afternoon and evening. It's something to keep an eye on, Adrian. All right, we'll all be watching meteorologist Ryan Snodden in Halifax. Now in St. John, New Brunswick, there's a more immediate concern. The entire city has been asked to shelter in place to avoid a cloud of hazardous smoke spewing from a stubborn fire at a scrapyard. And as Harry Forstall explains, for some residents, the facility was already notorious. An alarming wake-up call for residents of West St. John. A 30-foot high inferno of shredded automobiles, sending flames billowing into the sky, firefighters struggling just to contain the blaze. And just across the street, some very worried neighbors. I've never seen anything like this before. It's like, it's like a volcano. Look up in the sky, like that is amazing to see. Obviously this is a concern to people with the chemicals that's, that are involved, the plastics and uh, rubber products mm -hmm. that are involved in this. And it sounds like there's many explosions. Barely a kilometer from uptown St. John, where thick drifting smoke forced three schools to close for the day, and prompted this warning from local health authorities. I strongly recommend that people across the city of St. John, along with those who see or smell smoke in neighboring communities, so outside the skirt of St. John, should shelter in place whenever possible until the fire is brought under control. American Iron and Metal CEO Herb Black today blamed the fire on a failed security system he said hackers shut down the site's outdoor cameras last spring. But this is only the latest incident in the Montreal company's troubled history in St. John. Neighbors have long complained about the recycling center's incessant noise, its window rattling explosions, fires, and two workplace deaths. At the end of the day, it's a real demonstration of how something that's heavy industry uh, doesn't mix in a residential community. But the port is owned by the federal government. St. John City bylaws don't apply here, and there's no indication American Iron and Metal will be moving anytime soon. Harry Forrestal, CBC News, Fredericton. The U.S. president's son is now indicted on three federal gun charges. They're all tied to allegations that Hunter Biden lied about his illegal drug use on federal forms while buying a gun back in 2018. This indictment comes weeks after the collapse of a plea deal that would have avoided a criminal trial. If convicted, Hunter Biden faces up to 25 years in prison. Now to the results of a NASA investigation into everyone's favorite topic, UFOs. As Paul Hunter tells us, after a year-long investigation, the space agency says... There's no proof of aliens yet. They are among planet Earth's more tantalizing mysteries. Objects seen zipping through the sky so quickly, erratically, so otherworldly. Could they in fact be alien spacecraft? It's rotating. A year ago, NASA opened a new study on unidentified anomalous phenomena, or UAPs, what they used to call UFOs. Now some results. The NASA independent study team did not find any evidence that UAP have an extraterrestrial origin. But we don't know what these UAP are. 
it's that last part that's led NASA to announce it's stepping up its game. Because if they don't know what they are, what if they really did come from way out there? NASA's now hired a director of UAP research and wants the public to weigh in with any evidence or sightings, any data it can get. Shift the conversation about UAP from sensationalism to science. I think something is happening. After all, from Hollywood films through the decades to this week's strange, possibly dubious claim of discovered alien bodies in Mexico, it's clear Earthlings like to at least dream that we're not alone. Do I believe there's life in a universe that is so vast that it's hard for me to comprehend how big it is? My personal answer is yes. And so, says NASA, next time you look up, keep an eye out. And if you see something near or far, let them know. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Romania is extending flight restrictions along its border with Ukraine. This after more debris suspected to be from Russian drones was discovered on its soil. This all comes as Russia intensifies attacks on Ukraine's nearby ports. Briar Stewart now with the calls for calm. Near the banks of the Danube River in Romania, soldiers are building air raid shelters because just a few hundred meters away, Ukrainian ports are now frequently under attack. <laughs> Russia stepped up its strikes in this area after pulling out of the Black Sea grain deal in July. Since then, Romania, a NATO country, has found fragments from two Russian drones on its land. And it's investigating more debris found Wednesday. We're scared, said this woman. Last evening, they struck again. There are a lot of bombings. Villagers are now getting alerts to their phones, warning about the risk, but officials are also appealing for calm. Nobody attacked us and nobody will attack us, said Romania's prime minister. There have been fears that Russia's war could quickly spill into the rest of Europe if a NATO member came under attack. In November, two people were killed by a missile in Poland, but NATO officials believe it was a stray from Ukraine's air defense. Then, like now, the message is that these incidents don't warrant a bigger response. It would have to be a deliberate, concerted effort involving a large number of military forces uh, poised against NATO territory in a way that's unambiguous. I don't think Russia has the interest to do so. But Russia's intentions may be little comfort to those navigating boats along the Danube, which is more congested as Ukraine races to export its grain along this route. There were some stoppages during the uh, nights when uh, the Russian Federation bombed that uh, Ukrainian uh, facility. And along the river and the shore, it appears that the war is that much closer. Briar Stewart, CBC News, London. A grandmother is speaking out after her child and grandchild died of an overdose. She was walking independently, but not very steady. An addiction that killed a family why help was hard to come by. A shocking road rage incident on a major highway. Now this is something that it should never be happening. And French films are making a splash at the box office, but English audiences have yet to take notice. It's like there's no conversation between French Canada and English Canada. We're back in two. Well, there's a preposterous scene. Two people wrestling on the 401 highway in Toronto, smack in the middle of the evening rush hour Tuesday. Police say this was a matter of road rage. It was enough for them to stop and then ultimately get out of their vehicles. And as you can see in those videos, uh, rolling around the highway, uh, in incredible. Uh, I'm just speechless. Yeah, don't do that. The fight essentially shut down the highway. By the time police got there, the two men were gone, but they were able to eventually speak with one of them. Well, police say the incident was unacceptable. They let the driver off with a caution. A new report shows that deaths from drugs and alcohol in Ontario surged dramatically during the pandemic. 
In 2018, drugs and alcohol were involved in the deaths of more than 1,500 people. In 2021, that number had nearly doubled to nearly 2,900. Opioids drove that trend. And even when deaths involved other drugs or alcohol, 85% of the victims were mixing them with opioids. Every one of these deaths in Ontario and across the country represents a tragic story. And as Sam Sampson brings us one from Saskatoon of two parents and their toddler, all of them dead within the space of six months from overdoses, and of their surviving family hoping to save others before it's too late. So what I have is a copy of the funeral cards. It's all that's left of Anne Doig's son and his family after suspected overdoses. Madison died first on New Year's Day. In February, the father, John Cowan, and in June, the mother, Berkeley Donkervoort. She was walking independently, but not very steady. Doig says coroner reports show Madison died with fentanyl, carfentanyl, and benzodiazepines in her stomach. The parent systems contained a similar mix of drugs. Doig says Madison's parents used illicit drugs before, during, and after the pregnancy. She called police and social services several times, concerned for Madison's safety. It's a dreadful thing to think. But as I say, absent a very powerful intervention and sustained over a long period of time, that little girl's hope of anything resembling a normal <laughs> life was, was fraught. This specialist helped create a support network in Toronto for mothers with addictions. He says it takes the housing sector, health care, child protection and the legal system all working to keep families together. Just because that person has an active addiction, it doesn't mean that they have to lose custody over that child forever. Mm -hmm. But what it can mean is that there are other people who are brought in place to make sure that that child is raised safely, is loved, is hugged. Doig and other families want a safe drug supply for parents with substance use disorder. The Saskatchewan government says it's instead focusing on addiction recovery. Minister of Social Services. Susan Donkervoort is Berkeley's mom and Madison's other grandma. She wishes the baby was removed from the home. She tried calling authorities and politicians for help. All I can do is maybe try and help another family not have to go through what my family's all just been through. This is the closest she got to meeting Madison on what would have been the baby's second birthday. Sam Sampson, CBC News, Saskatoon. The federal government scrambles to deal with the cost of living crisis. It's the right time to step up with uh, removing the federal GST. But will their new measures make any difference? Rosie's here with that issue. Canadian films take center stage a tiff why those made in French reign supreme. French Canadian film has always been Canada's most, most valued. And a cub caught in a jam, Ooh. finally free. Here you go. He kind of sat there dumbstruck. The National breaks down the story shaping our world. Next. Amidst the premieres at this year's Toronto International Film Festival are several big French-Canadian movies, a genre that has eclipsed the success of this country's English-language movies. Eli Glasner looks at what's behind that success. A suspected murderer on trial. Vous admettez qu'il était jaloux. No, I don't, I don't know. A conductor looking for harmony. And a drama set in Montreal's drag scene. Three very different films, but a sign of French language cinema that is a consistent commercial and critical success. The majority of films made in Canada are English language. But look at last year. French language films earned nearly $10 million, while their English counterparts earned $2 million. French Canadian film has always, from the, kind of from the beginning, been Canada's most, most valued um, cinematic export. Film. Of course, part of what protects Quebec's film sector is language. Not having to worry about losing French fans to the likes of Tom Cruise helps, but the language barrier also retains talent. Because we don't speak English that well, <laughs> like me, um, we cannot go anywhere else. But really, so everybody stays there and we can create all together. And while movies from Quebec and France have distinct differences, 
Both enjoy an industry where the director truly calls the shots. I'm not forced to do something a way or another. They trust my process. And maybe that's why our films are, I don't know, there's a signature to them. Thank you. French filmmakers and stars say there's a missed opportunity for all Canadian filmmakers to be watching and learning from each other. I think that's something that we should uh, we should look look to to to, to make a change because it's like there's no conversation between French Canada and English Canada in, in cinema. But at the festival, TIFF audiences are kickstarting the conversation. They're open to see new stuff and uh, even from director they don't know yet. As the new wave of French films takes center stage. Eli Glasser, CBC News, Toronto. Time to break down the news shaping our world. It's Thursday. Rosie's here with that issue. At issue this week, Canada's housing crisis. The country is on track to be short three and a half million units by the end of the decade. After months of pressure to act, the Prime Minister announced measures to help Canadians with the cost of living, including cutting the GST on new rental bills. We realize it's the right time to step up with uh, removing the federal GST on uh, purpose-built uh, apartment buildings. The opposition says the government has not acted soon enough. A year and a half of paperwork and not a single house built since it was announced in the spring of 2022. Is the government doing enough to solve the housing crisis? I'm Rosemary Barton to break it down this week. Chantelle Bear, Andrew Coyne, and Althea Raj. Good to see you all. Um, Chantelle, let's start with you. You know, many of these things that were announced today had been previously discussed um, or things that, you know, Jagmeet Singh or others had called for. What do you make of the timing of this? Well, uh, politically interesting. Uh, at the time when the polls are really turning south for the Liberals, uh, with the House about to come back. Uh, but I, the sound I most heard today as the Prime Minister was announcing the measures he was announcing was the sound of a rug being or trying to be pulled from under the feet of Pierre Poiliev. <laughs> I can't tell you, I'm not a housing expert, whether these measures will in the long run make a difference. But I can tell you that uh, they take pages from Pierre Poiliev's <clears throat> biggest battle horse so far. And I'm guessing that the hope is over the next year and a half, two years to the election, to neutralize the housing issue uh, rather than continue to have it be a sword issue for the Conservatives as it has been. It's housing that works for Pierre Poiliev, Andrew, but it's also affordability. And the government also tried to deal with some of that today with the calling in the grocery chains to, to yell at them and put down <laughs> uh, prices and all that kind of thing. What, what did you make of the timing? Uh, a lot of politics involved, not just the polling politics or the opposition politics, but the internal Liberal Party politics. Yeah. So if you've got caucus baying at you to do something about this problem, then uh, doing something is what you do, regardless of what that something is. Uh, this is not going to address the, the full scale of the housing problem. The CMHC says we need to build something in the order of three and a half to four million new housing units in addition to the ones we would have already have built, which yeah. amounts to about tripling uh, the current rate of construction. Um, fiddling around with GST rebates is not going to get you that kind of anywhere close to that level of uh, housing, new housing supply. And if we really want to get a grip on uh, housing prices, we also have to look at things, the ways in which we're now um, um, artificially stimulating the demand for housing. Mm -hmm. uh, either way, to actually talk about lowering the price of housing means you're tangling with the, the interests of people, the, the majority of people already own homes. So what you're going to see is what you've seen is a lot of flapping of wings on all sides about this issue, but not really effective policies, and I include the opposition in that. Whether Trudeau can neutralize the issue, however, I think depends upon where housing prices actually go. And if we're still talking about a housing crisis and housing prices uh, being so high a year or two from now, I don't think it'll matter uh, what policies he brings out or what policies the opposition will be. The, the sitting government uh, wears that. Althea? I would say not just neutralize it, but actually hope that it can turn into a win for the Liberal government yeah. because they came in in 2015 saying, hey, the Harper government has done like nothing during an entire time in office and we're going to take housing seriously. But at the time, they were really focused on affordable housing and now it's not just affordable housing they need to deal with. 
Um, to Chantal's point about the sound, I, like to me, the sound was relief from the caucus benches mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. all of the things that he announced today, whether it's you know delaying the SIBA loans for a year, uh, the GST off-purpose built rental housing, um, the the groceries, the, you know, all of this are actually things that MPs and my conversations with them over the past two three weeks yeah. have talked about. These are solutions that they've been that have been kicked around. These are things that they've heard at the door. These are things that they themselves as a group have talked about. So it was like, finally, the prime minister is listening. And yeah. it wasn't just that. It was the way it was framed. Like, finally, the prime minister came out and he said, we have a plan. This is who we're fighting for. It's the middle class and everyone who's working hard to join it in case you'd forgotten it. And then he said all these things about nice things about caucus. Yeah. But it was really, to me, more a caucus management issue as well as like, hey, Pierre Polyev, you can say yeah. whatever you want on the sidelines, but we are still a government and we still have the actual ability and, to do yeah. things. And we'll talk more about caucus and whether he's managed to calm them in the next blog. But Chantal, you want something to say something? Uh, yes, on the grocery uh, stuff, yeah. I actually see in it the signal that uh, this is a government that really, really wants to keep the NDP on side and for this parliament to last. Uh, who is right. going after grocery prices for the past six, seven months? Yeah. It was Jack Mead Singh to the point where I came late to watching the news conference the prime minister gave. And he was in, in the middle of a, a nambali on grocery prices. And if it had not been for the accent, I might have thought <laughs> I was listening to an NDP news conference. Mm -hmm. The difference between the NDP, which can only say, call, haul them in and do something, and the government is the government has levers or, well, being called into the office of the principal is not the yeah. same thing as going to see the guidance teacher. But it's, it this it's way. preposterous, <laughs> though. I mean. Yes. For the federal government, the leader of the federal government, which oversees an explicit price-fixing ring in the production of major food items like chicken and eggs and butter, uh, to be going after the grocery store uh -oh. executives yeah. Yeah. on the issue of high food prices is just the height of hypocrisy. Uh, okay, we can't turn this into a supply management debate. Well, I, 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 I'm talking <laughs> about the policy versus the no. politics. Yeah. 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 Yes, no, I hear you. But, but I, even more to the point, though, Andrew, it, when I did an interview with the prime minister in December, I asked him about this very thing, and he said, oh, no, I would never call in the grocery guys because then they'll tax everyone more and they'll, ta they'll, they'll end up passing that down to consumers. Like, this was not even on the radar back in December, and now suddenly, it's a great idea to, to bring them to Ottawa. Go it's, ahead. it's amazing what uh, being at 26% in the polls uh, will ch how it will change your perspective. And yes, uh, keeping the NDP on board and keeping that section of the voting constituency at least uh, giving the Liberals a chance is part is obviously part of the agenda. Well, what does this do, Althea? We're, none of us are housing experts, but what, what should Canadians take away from whether this is going to improve the, the situation? Like, do, do we have any sense on whether this is going to make things easier for people, or is this really just all about the politics? Uh, on the housing front, on the GST, yeah, I think it will make a difference. Already you're seeing some people say, well, maybe we won't build a condo building, maybe we will build uh, a rental apartments instead. Mm. Um, it is a solution. Uh, it's not the end all and be all, but it's part of a solution that experts have long suggested the government should do. And in fact, the government said itself it should do this yeah. a few years ago. Um, on the grocery, um, the heads of the grocery chains, I mean, I think it, it's interesting what you said, because he actually threatened to tax them more, which yes. would result in exactly the same thing that you outlined. Um, I think what's important is that uh, the Prime Minister signaled that this is not just uh, one announcement as like this is supposed to be the answer to the problems. This is the beginning of several announcements mm -hmm. on housing. And the housing minister has, has told the public that in the federal economic update there will be a housing more. plan. Yeah. So there will be yeah. there will be more. What does that look like? I don't know. But I yeah. think it is interesting that there is actual common ground between what Pierre Polyev is talking about and what the federal government is, is talking about yeah. in terms of densification, NIMBYism, yeah. ending exclusionary zoning municipally. Um, I think that the Conservative plan lacks nuance, and I think that that is something that is going to come out more and more because you can't just threaten to withhold cash from municipalities mm -hmm, who mm -hmm. actually need it to get some of yeah. that housing built. If you have, uh, you know, inadequate sewage infrastructure and you yeah, need federal yeah. cash in order to be able to build more to add to that, yeah. now you would be in a catch-22 where you you have access to no cash. 
Yeah, yeah. Chantal quickly and then Andrew quickly. Uh, yeah, well, so still, there was uh, uh, some of that Pierre Poilievre spirit and some of the, the, the small, smaller letters in the announcement today, i.e., if you're not going to change uh, or remove some zoning restrictions, mm -hmm. municipalities, mm -hmm. yeah. or build next to transit um, stops, we will not give you access yeah. to our fund for housing. Yeah. It, it's not the same. But it is mostly taken from the same kind of page. Yeah, Andrew, last word. Uh, this is not going to triple the rate of housing construction. It's fantasy land. Uh, this is, this is uh, them announcing something so that they have something to announce on both sides of the aisle. Neither of these things is going to make the difference. There's going to have to be a whole lot more policy, and we'll see what it comes in, in, okay. in the fall. But this is not going to do it. Okay, but it's a, a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to take a break. We're going to take a break. More at issue coming up. But what we're for focused on right now uh, is how we're going to deliver for Canadians. So we talked about it a bit. How bad is that grumbling inside Liberal Caucus? Could it affect the PM's future? That's next. But we know that there is more to do. MPs have given Trudeau an earful behind closed doors, sharing concerns about the party's dismal showing in the polls and demanding a more forceful response to Pierre Poiliev. Sources have described the conversations as blunt and frank, but the Prime Minister today said this about caucus. We are, as a team, united and focused on solving the big challenges that Canadians are facing. Did Trudeau do enough to reassure that team things can turn around and he is the leader to do it? Welcome back to At Issue, here to break all that down. The challenges facing the caucus, Chantal, Andrew, and Althea. Althea, let's start with you here. I, I know that there were a lot of, there's a lot of grumbling going in. Uh, they were all standing behind him looking okay <laughs> at the end of things. Should he uh, be concerned about his job? Should he be concerned about that complaining that he's hearing? I think he got the jolt that he needed, that the people around him, frankly, needed. I think a lot of the people who spoke to me, and I know some people uh, spoke to the CBC as well, um, you know, it wasn't necessarily out of anger. Like, there are a few people who really want to get rid of the prime minister, but most of them just want to see the liberals <laughs> awaken. Yeah. And I think what you saw today was the prime minister, prime minister saying, Ah, the patient is alive. I am here after all. <laughs> I, uh, there is life here. Um, don't, don't write us off yet. And mm -hmm. that, to me, I think was the number one issue that caucus needed uh, yeah. to hear. And I think that they did hear that. The other but, issue yeah. is yep. they needed to feel listened to and valued. And he, yeah. three times in his speech, he talked about the good work caucus was doing. And they needed to hear that because he doesn't maintain his relationship with caucus. Yeah. Um, he, you know, he's a people person for like the rest of us, the public watching this, but he is not, he's like an introvert internally. And my, co my colleague, Susan Delacour talks about this often, yeah. but uh, you know, they're not feeling the love and they needed to feel the love. Andrew. I thought he got off pretty lightly, frankly, considering where they're at in the polls, uh, but they don't really have anybody else. They know that they owe their jobs to him uh, and you know, when you usually when caucus is really feeling feisty and really threatening the leader, they'll say things like, he's getting very bad advice, it's time he replaced his, you know, principal advisors. Mm -hmm. uh, they, we didn't even hear much of that. Oh, you know. no, we, we, we do hear lots of that. Some behind Katie the scenes. Katie Telford but, is like I number know. one. But, <laughs> but behind the scenes, you, did, yes, you, you yes. weren't seeing Gone anybody going on the record still. saying yeah. it. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I think it's a measure of how weak the caucus is in this party, how much it's leader dominated, that even when they are 15 points behind in the polls, mm. um, they're, they just really don't have much of an alternative. Or is it because, Chantal, he can walk into the room and, and listen and convince people that, that, no. that everything's going to be okay? I mean, I don't know. Well, uh, there is some of that. He did yeah. get them elected, and uh, that uh, cuts you a bit of slack with caucus. But if there was a, a, a successor, a Paul Martin type, that polled a lot better uh, than the current prime minister, I think those uh, MPs would feel less uh, <laughs> uh, of a we like, we, we still like Justin Trudeau mood, and they, they might be inclined. This is the party that showed Jean Chrétien the door or tried to show Jean Chrétien the door. Why? Because they believed they had Paul Martin, he would do better and he would treat those who felt left out better. Mm -hmm. There is no one like that standing in the shadows no, no. Of, uh, of Justin Trudeau. I also believe that many of the MPs, the, the message they mostly received, I think, today was the message that the government still has time 
and <clears throat> you saw mm -hmm. the prime minister said we're not having an election till 2025. Yeah. Well, I think if you do not see an improvement in the polls within four to six months, the, the, the discontent will resurface and probably resurface in a way that will be difficult to push back on. But, but at that point, Althea, you're sort of running out of time, right? If you're like, I don't know, in six months, you're not going to get rid of someone and start again, are you? I don't like, I, I, there, there's, a, there's a time management game that, that everyone is playing here too. It depends how bad it gets, I guess I, suppose, I would yeah, say. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would say it's not everybody who feels like they're a member of parliament because of Justin Trudeau. In fact, many of them feel that they are a member of parliament in spite of Justin Trudeau. <laughs> uh, some of whom were elected in 2021 and 2019, and sure. it wasn't that 2015 wave that brought them to Ottawa. And you know, you see that especially with MPs um, from rural areas who feel like the liberal agenda hasn't necessarily matched up with what the, their constituents are telling them. Mm -hmm. And in fact, before a caucus, I was thinking, you know, with Mr. Goliev going where he is, there might be some liberal MPs that might be ready to cross the floor and pluck them. I, I didn't put this to them. I'm just saying where Mr. Goliev was going and the concerns, like how intense and acute the criticism mm -hmm, against the mm -hmm. prime minister was. Um, but actually, I think this week, Mr. Poilievre sounds back like Skippy and less prim prime ministerial and more like that little aggressive attack dog. Yeah. And the prime minister seems to have found his footing. So let's see what yeah. happens on Monday. I mean, we, w we went from a, you know, a week where it was a lot of people grumbling quietly, you know, or privately anyway, to reporters, not in front of cameras, to Andrew's point, to him standing there with the caucus behind him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, that's, not, that's not nothing. I, I, I know it's all acting, Chantal, but, but I mean, that's not, no, it's but not, seriously, it's not nothing. What did yeah. you expect? Seriously, uh, you're a member of caucus and yeah. uh, you need help to get reelected from yeah. the party. And you're told to stand behind the leader and you're going to say, no, I'm not. Yeah. Or well, I'm just going to go like this behind this <laughs> head. Show and the leader not, who signs your nomination <laughs> form? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I mean, I'm naive. Seriously. I'm naive. I'm naive. What it, so is it? Is it? Uh, it's put to bed then for now? Is that? Is that how I should take that, Chantel? Then, Andrew? Uh, me, I think four to six months. Uh, if the next budget uh, is looks like it's mashed potatoes. <laughs> um, a lot of MPs are going to be thinking uh, about whether they want to run for re-election. There is no sure. process for a caucus to, the Liberal caucus, no, no. to yep. show the exit to Justin Trudeau. But by the way, Brian Mulroney resigned in a fifth year of a term, uh, as did Pierre Trudeau. Yeah, you don't need a process if caucus is angry enough, uh, Andrew. And there's <laughs> a real question about whether, in fact, their interests would be served by getting rid of him. Uh, if you're going to go down to defeat, uh, there's an argument for saying better to go down under the old guy than under the new person because yes. then he wears it rather than the new person. If right. Brian Mulroney had led the Conservatives in 1993, they still would have lost and badly, but not as badly as they did under Kim Campbell. Um, and, the, you know, the other thing is, is you know, there's, there's you, anytime you have a leadership race, you risk opening up new divisions within the party that, you, that the leader had previously been able to, to yeah. cover over. Yeah. And you have to ask the question whether the new leader could do well in the sections of the country where they absolutely have to do well, namely That's Quebec. Right. Okay, we'll leave it there. I'm sure we'll talk about all of this more as time goes on. Thank you. I'll send things now back to Adrian in Toronto. Thank you, Rosie. Next, a bear cub in need of a little help. It wasn't really fear, just, just knowing that I needed to do something and do it fast. How a passerby came to its aid in our moment. Well, this sad little reality is the sight a Pennsylvania woman stumbled upon on the side of the road, a bear cub desperate and exhausted, trapped inside a plastic container. So knowing that the frightened cub wouldn't survive unless it was freed, Sarah Lindgren made a decision. What happened next is our moment. Come on. Oh, there you go. You're okay. There wasn't really a lot of emotion in the moment. I was heading down into the town of Cross Fork and I noticed what looked like a bear with something on its head just laying motionless on the, on the berm of the road. I obviously did a scan before I walked up. I just, I knew that mom wasn't around. So I just grabbed the container and held on until I got it pulled off. And then he kind of sat there dumbstruck looking at me and I kind of hung out so he didn't run out onto the road or like topple over. You all right, baby? 
the car came, he spooked up into a tree and sat there and rested for a few hours. And then I saw it the next day and um, it was doing a little better. It's old enough to be without its mother. I think the biggest message here is just to be bear wise, you know, securing your trash, securing your food items. It's a big part of being bear wise. Yeah, that was tough, wasn't it? Because it was just it was like, oh, I need to do this. And I just did it. Well, it's a good thing Mama Bear was not around. Uh, Sarah is braver than the likes of mere mortals like me. I would have run away. But she also uh, works for the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. She's helped out a few animals. We're glad she did. From all of us at The National, thank you for being with us. You can watch anywhere, anytime on the free CBC News app. Subscribe to The National's YouTube channel. I'm Adrienne Arsenault. Take care.